You're listening to the number one podcast for nonprofit leaders, getting your nonprofit fully funded. This is the Fundraising Masterminds Podcast. We get this term in our head. It's built into yeah. our world's culture. You could have somebody in this next three seconds walk in your door and say, I don't know why I'm supposed to do this, but I'm supposed to completely fund your organization. Who wants to give to a sinking ship? Well, hey, we're so glad that you are here for another episode of the Fundraising Masterminds podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I'm your host, Jason Galsinski, and with me, my co-host, Jim Dempsey. Hey, everyone. Well, we are excited about this topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about words to avoid when you're a nonprofit leader. Absolutely. And uh, what's kind of interesting about this is that... Um, there's it's kind of a double-edged sword here because yes. we are preaching to people all the time about some of these words to avoid, but yet we have to operate in a different world because of the YouTube algorithm and the podcast world that we're trying to be live in, right? The words we're trying to stay away from are the very words <laughs> that set off positively the YouTube algorithm. So yeah. this is equivalent. Or search terms. Or search terms. Search terms are equi- this is equivalent to tap dancing in a landmine field. <laughs> so it right. really is, uh, we're going to have to tiptoe. It's kind of like if you want the gospel to be reached in a faraway land, you've got to move to that faraway land, yeah. learn their lingo, learn how they live, learn their language, learn what makes them tick, understand who they are, and then you can translate the Bible into their language, right. try to teach the principles, right. right? And that's kind of what we are doing here, right. even though we say we don't like these words. Unfortunately, these are the words that our online culture they uses. They use, they understand, and it's really the only way we can explain. So until people embrace and understand our vocabulary, we've got to embrace their vocabulary yeah. for at least a season. So the first word is uh, fundraising. It is. And, and yes, what's it- interesting about this word is that we have chosen it for our podcast and for our brand and everything, fundraising masterminds. Right. But we really don't like the term fundraising, really. No, but- we don't. We don't embrace that. Uh, and if you watched our video, Scarcity Versus Abundance Mentality, you learned that our desire is to build friends and not funds. Right. So we we really advocate more the friend raising than fundraising. But we know that in our world today, for us to have called it friend raising masterminds, we probably would have had to explain every time we talked to someone what our organization was about. Right. And so it was important for us to do that. But well, here's the, the bottom line on this, why we're not big advocates. We believe that when you use the term fundraising, you're emphasizing a strong desire to get into people's pocketbooks, that your major focus is getting funds. And that is very transactional. And transactional is equal to having to deal with an ATM. All of us every day have to work with an ATM somewhere. Yeah. But we don't really care much about an ATM until we need money. Right. When we need money, those ATMs are very important to us. Yeah. And then we extract the money from the ATM and we don't need an ATM again. In fact, we pretty much ignore the ATM again until we need money again. Right. And unfortunately, that is what happens with a lot of our partners. Hmm. We as nonprofit leaders sometimes only view our people as ATMs and they yeah. feel like they're only important when we need money. That's the furthest thing from what we want to do in our organization. Yeah. We want to focus in on a transformational relationship. Do you call it a campaign or what, what do you refer to a fundraiser at crew? Like how do you, you well, say- in fact, I don't use the term developer and I don't use the term 
friend uh, fundraiser either. Yeah, but you we, don't call it fundraiser. You don't. No, no. We do an event or an activity or a program or an income thrust. Uh, that's typically what we'll call things that raise money. It's important to understand that we don't like the term fundraiser because of the focus of right. the transactional right, relationship. Right. But I don't want people to think that we are against raising funds yeah. for your organization, yeah. right? So yeah. someone listening to this might say, well, okay, okay, you're you're calling it a fundraiser, you're doing an event, but really it's a fundraiser. Like that's how they think yeah, of it. Is you're, that's right. You're doing all this stuff, you're calling it something different, but right. you're really getting money yeah, in the yeah, bank, yeah. you know, through a different way. But it's really, it's really a different mindset Right. Yeah, yeah. I think what it's what, just semantics or it's yeah. whitewashing what it's the not, truth is. It's not really though. It's a it's a no. different way of thinking a, about people. A right? totally different mindset. Totally different yeah. mindset. Yeah. So although it might result in that person giving you funds. That's right. Right. It's through a relationship. That's right. You know, where they feel very much connected, invited to be a part yeah. of the yeah. The effort, and so they're giving because they want to give. Yeah. They, they're giving yeah. because you've asked them to give, or you've invited them yeah. in to have a partnership. It's a byproduct. It's an end result to uh, to a long process. It's what we call transformational relationships. So you have transactional, which is just simply a business. I give you money, you give me a, uh, a service back. Right, but. It's yeah. the in the kind nonprofit of, world, it's I ask you for money, you give me money, I perform a service. I ask you for more money, you give me more money. I ask to do a service. As the as the partner, uh, the the person giving the gift, you're not part of that. I, don't I feel do connected. that completely separate from you. Right. A transformational relationship is when you embrace your partner, you bring them into the fold. We do this as a partnership together. You're a co co owner, an investor. You right. are part of the process. Yeah. We together, hand in hand, walk down and accomplish that. Right, right. Uh, I, one of our leaders uses a, a terrific analogy hmm. in that he talked about one time while he was swimming and someone actually went under an undertow oh. and together they formed a chain of people to fish through the water to try and find this young man. Wow. That's what we're talking about is going arm in arm, hand in hand, to accomplish that task together. Right. So when we're talking about our dinner and our perfect vision dinner, Jason, is a great example. Yeah. Some people go into, and a lot of really, and not a lot of nonprofit leaders go into dinners like we do, thinking this is a fundraiser. And I'll hear it even when we try and coach people. Right. You'll hear the perfect vision dinner, our annual fundraiser. And it, what it's doing is it's counteracting what we're trying to do. Right. In my mind, the fundraising component is one small minor component of the evening. If you focus in on raising money, you're going to really miss yeah. what the purpose is of the right. Perfect Vision Dinner, right. which is to totally immerse someone in the ministry, embrace them, bring them into the fold so that they understand exactly who we are and together yeah. we work to accomplish goals. Right. And the partner decides that they're going to help with that, with right. their labor, their influence, their finances, and their expertise. Right. Right. And so the finance side, yeah, <laughs> money may come, like you mentioned, as, as an outgrowth of that, right. but it is not our primary focus. Right. Well, they, they feel a part of a movement, right? right. It's like being a part of the Billy Graham crusade movement, right. the people who funded that felt like they were a part yeah, of something yeah, bigger. Yeah. Well, that they, they right? were like, they were leading people to Christ themselves because they helped yeah. to fund that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, I mean, imagine if Billy Graham just said, I want to do a bunch of crusades around the world and I just need money from you. I don't, I don't need your help or whatever. I, I I'll take care of input. everything. Yeah. Just give me money right. and let me do their thing. Yeah. I bet you he wouldn't have been nearly as impactful. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah, I got this. Just give me your money. Right. And I, there was a whole generation. There was the greatest generation that really lived that way. They were fine with giving to a church. They could care less about the 
involvement the being part of the decision making process right. when the baby boom generation came in they were the first generation that wanted to be part of the decision making within a church and a ministry they said you know what if we're given money we want to help to make the decision and every generation from that point on mm-hmm. we're talking gen x millennials and z's uh, all wanted to be involved in that right. decision making well, you know and be why. part of that because Jesus said, where your money is, there your heart is also. Right, where right. Where your treasure is, there That's your right. heart is also. That's exactly right. So wherever we lead with our money, That's right. our heart follows yeah. that money. Yeah, right? That's so exactly right. So if we're giving right. money to the Billy Graham organization to fund that, well, guess what? We're going to want to be a part of that. We're going to want to find out what they're doing <laughs> and the plans that they're they're making. Yeah. So it's so important. Well, yeah, I understand why it's important. Um, and I really think if you're listening to this, it's really important to understand what it is that we're talking about here because this is a fundamental foundational principle that we teach Uh, if you want to get more in depth about it we have a podcast episode that's available on youtube you can look it up on spotify it's called friend raising versus fundraising and we spend a whole hour almost talking about this concept right but it's really important it's not semantics right right the focus is on building those relationships and inviting people in right right and Mm -hmm. trusting god to provide the funds right versus just asking for money right right and that's then right. not having a relationship with someone that's right uh, and the reason why that's so important is kind of like leading into term number two term number two that we avoid as a nonprofit leader is the term donor right right exactly and you always like to say a donor is someone who gives blood at a blood right. bank exactly well the last thing we want to do is extract blood from one of our partners exactly right. yeah right. we don't want them to think that we are just out to drain the uh yeah, the, you blood know, the, the, the blood or the money really from our partners right. that we want them a, a donor is really a third party in a situation they are set aside they were off to the side they're not part of the decision making process right. they are they simply give money and are out of the whole mix a partner however comes alongside with us they are co-owners they're investors we see them as as hand in hand in the decision making the the ministry the engagement in what we're doing there's different parts of the body a couple terms that really harken back to the old testament there were uh kings and there were priests Mm-hmm. The priest's responsibility were to perform the duties of the sacrifices, right, exactly, and and interact at the temple. Right. Now, the kings were responsible for the day-to-day operations, going to war, going to battle, dealing with the kinds of things, but they helped to fund the efforts of the priests. The priest's responsibility, they were the one that were set aside to do hmm. priestly duties. Right. That's how we work in the sense that hand in hand, we're all part of one tribe together, but we both have have different responsibilities or different parts of the body as we talked about. Right. And so you've got individuals who are gifted in raising money. God has blessed them with the ability to raise money. They do raise quite a bit of money and that God is gonna use them to help to fund the efforts, but together, right. not set apart, but together. And I think the the term fundraiser and donor right. tend to go hand in hand. Like That's right. You do fundraisers to get donors right. or donations right. from a donor. Yes. Right. Even even the term is built into our CRMs and our software. It's right. like you it's hard to get away from it, right? You you get right. a CRM and it's like, what's your donor's first name? What's That's your right. donor's last name? That's right. How what kind of mailing list do you want to send to your donor? Right. You know, and it, we we get this term in our head that we're making donors. Right. And it's it's really hard to get away from. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. it's built into yeah. our world's culture. Yeah. Uh, but we really don't want to think of our people as right. donors. Yeah. We're not extracting money from them. That's we're right. they're partnering with us. That's right. Right. And we want to look at them as partners. That's right. Yeah. Life changing partners. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's Without exactly them, right. the ministry doesn't happen. Right. That's right. Um, the third word that we try to avoid, which is kind of similar to mm-hmm. donor, yeah. is donation. Donation. Yes. Another cold, hard, transactional 
word. Yeah. Yeah. It's we're talking about uh, do having a donation. Well, of course, a donor gives a donation. Right. The term that we prefer is gift or give. give. Yeah. So there's yeah. there's donation and donate, gift and give. Right. And so we really prefer that term. Well, let's do let's do a little role play here. Okay. Jim Dempsey, we are in critical need of funding this Christmas. We want to end our nonprofit in the black and we are in desperate need of your help. We need you to donate $100 or $500 to our cause so that we can reach people uh, in the area of homelessness. And we need to do this before December 31st so that we can end in the black. Are you saying that if you don't do this, the doors may shut and yes. the next day you, you may better not... give today or wow. we may not be able to provide this wonderful wow. service to the community. Wow. We need you to give. We need you to donate today. Wow. You well, can donate at this website www.myhomelessshelter.com. Absolutely. We depend on your donations every single week. Well, I thought it was going to be www.we'regoingunder.org. <laughs> yeah, it, it, what I hear is this is a sinking ship. This is a ship that that if they if I don't get the money from them, we're going to go under. Yeah. And who wants to give money to a sinking ship? Right. It's, here's a here's another uh, phone call that we my wife made the mistake of donating oh, <laughs> to, yes. to the fo to the local fire department, right, one, which we right. actually live right next to the, the fire chief. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's his fire department, but we it was some fire department in Tennessee, right? Okay. And then like every single day for like six months oh, man. it was like ring hey we depend on <laughs> donations from you to you know support the local fire chief can we depend on a donation this week from you you know right, it's just like right right I don't even know what you're doing. Yeah, you know, and, and I just, hate to get those because I'm always thinking if I don't give, there's going to be some little mark on my mailbox. <laughs> the next time my house catches on fire, I'm gonna. It's going to be a long wait before right. the fire department gets to them. Yeah, yeah. Those things are just they're just the worst. Yeah, absolutely. All right, absolutely. now you you sure. do you give me yeah. a homeless yeah. shelter yeah. appeal. Yeah, from uh, this perspective of a friend raising for, partnership uh, for a gift. Absolutely. Hi, Jason. This is Jim Dempsey. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. You know, I've really appreciated your partnership with us in ministry. I can't tell you what an encouragement your involvement, your giving over the last year has just really encouraged, emboldened, strengthened, undergirded our ministry. Hmm. We couldn't be more blessed with your partnership. Wow. Let me tell you a quick story about John Smith. You know, John was caught in the cycle of poverty and homelessness. Mm. Because of your gift over the last year, we were able to bring John into our shelter, feed him on a regular basis. We set him up with training on how to use a computer. And you know what, Jason? What? John is now employed by the local police department doing computer technology. Wow. You're talking about within the last year, he went from homelessness to wow. now being profitable in what he's doing. Wow. And all that was because of my gift. All because of your gift. Wow. And as a result, we saw a major change. Hmm. Now, we've got other people like John who are in the same situation. They're coming in every single day, and we want to make a difference in their lives. I've got a great opportunity for you. I would love for you to consider a gift of $5,000 at year end to help make a difference in the lives of individuals just like John. Wow. We've got 10 more people just like John waiting in line out outside our door to have their lives changed and impact. Will you prayerfully consider a gift wow. at year end to help make a difference in the life of someone like John? 
Well, Jim, I appreciate your phone call. $5,000 is a lot, but I will get with my wife and pray about it. And I don't know if we can give $5,000, but we'll pray about what we can do for sure. Terrific, I really John. appreciate you calling. Thanks for telling that story. That was really an encouragement to me. Well, thank you again for your partnership. It always makes a big difference. So that's really, Jason, yeah. that's the difference between the two. One is cold and transactional. One, hopefully, is warm and transformational. Yeah. Uh, my effort was genuinely to make you feel comfortable, make you feel appreciated, make you feel recognized, make you feel like you were making a difference, that you were part yeah. of what we were doing. Right. The first analogy was... We need your money or we're going to die. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And who wants to give to something like that? Right. Yeah. Right. And I mean, sadly, there's a lot of Christian organizations that um, it's kind of, it, it's like they understand the idea of building partners and the idea of building relationships, but they still kind of treat their partners a little bit. They're, they're kind of like in the middle, yeah, you know, they're, that's right. they're kind of, they want to do this, but they, they don't fully understand right. why they do this, but they yeah. are still kind yeah. of treating them like, yeah. well, is, we're doing a fundraiser and we're, yeah. we need money, yeah. you know? And yeah. so they, they kind of have one foot in yeah. both sides. Yeah. And what we're saying is we really want to help you move to to this other side, yeah, you know, yeah, where we're yeah. really focused on people, yeah, you know, and serving people and putting them first, putting their needs first, right? You know, because when we take care of them, they will take care of us That's in right. return. So. That's right. Well, I believe they've embraced Jason the beggar mentality in the sense that they almost don't really believe that God's going to provide for them, and the only way they're going to get that money is by trying to convince someone that. The need yeah. is so great that if they don't give, then right. something bad's going to happen. And right. once again, who wants to give to a sinking ship? It's like, who wants to tip the people playing the violin as the Titanic was going under? Uh, nobody. And so <laughs> right. uh, it's uh, that that's the situation. That, yeah, that actually brings us to the fourth word, which is need. Right. We don't like the word need. Right. right? right. What's the word that you prefer? I prefer the term opportunity. It says that every organization has needs, but few have exciting opportunities. Right. People want to give to opportunities. Right. They don't want to give to needs. Needs has such a desperate feel to it. Yeah. It's it we're going to shut the door without you unless you give. Right. And it's the please give to us. It's that beggar mentality. Right. Whereas opportunity is I've got something exciting that's going on. It, yeah. it, it be synonymous with us trying to share the gospel with someone and saying, please accept Christ. Or right. I have found something that's made a difference in my own life personally. Yeah. I want to share that exciting opportunity with you. That's well, it's the really, same thing. It's really almost like you're trying to do it yourself yeah, your versus own, right, your own methods. letting God uh, do the work. Right. right. If I'm sharing the gospel with someone and I'm begging them to accept Christ... It's because I want to feel good. Right. Right. It's right. like, I want you to accept Christ because I want to feel like I'm a good person. Right. Like I did right. something right. to that's help right. you. That's right. And that's really not putting the other person first. No, no. And when we go to someone and say, we need you to help us, you know, or we're going to have to close down or we won't be able to do this yep. unless you help yep. us. Yep. It kind of feels desperate. Yep. And it also kind of feels like, well, you're, you're really not yep. trusting the yep. Lord. Like yep. maybe oh. God doesn't want you yep. to have this. That's maybe right. There's a reason yep. for that. Well, there's one thing I know for sure, Jason, that God is not on his last dime. Yeah. He, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If he wants to fund your organization, he could do it in a heartbeat. You could have somebody in this next three seconds, walk in your door and say, I don't know why I'm supposed to do this, but I'm supposed to completely fund your organization and more wow. uh, over yeah. the next 20 years. Right. But God just don't doesn't generally we work that way. We don't have faith that way. Yeah. We, we yeah. really don't believe yeah. that that's yeah. possible. Well, we don't believe, right. We don't believe that God's going to try, uh, believe and he's, that he's going to provide. Right. Yeah. So it, we, 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 we don't, we see, we hear about these things. Yeah. We know that those people are out there. Right. But because it doesn't make sense to us. Yeah. And we think logically, well, God probably won't do that for me. Yeah. That's right. You know, so then we take it on ourselves that's to do right. everything. Yeah. And that's where we get yeah. sucked into yeah. this mindset of I've got to do this. I've yeah. got to do Giving Tuesday. I've got yeah. to do the year yeah. end. Yeah. If I don't do this, then the organization is yeah. going to yeah. die. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've been hired as a development director. So it's my job. Yeah. It's my duty to make this happen. That's right. And so we get into this like, I got to do it. I yeah. got to 
I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and really it's, we really want to, we really need to let God yeah, have this yeah, ministry yeah. and, and kind of look at yeah. ourselves as we're in the passenger seat. We got to put God in the driver's seat right, and right. let him drive the ship. Yep. And then we are kind of more observing, well, what is God trying to do here? And right. let me kind of go where God is going. Yeah. You yeah. know, let's, uh, yeah. I don't know if that's a great analogy. No, or not, but no, that's good. Yeah. This, uh, what need says is desperation. It's, it's when we start to employ guilt, making people feel guilty about yeah. not helping us. And of course, manipulation, trying to manipulate people to give to something that they might not even be interested in giving to. Right. I present the opportunity and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. If someone says no to me, that means that God probably has somebody else who is going to provide. Right. The abundance mentality says that God has already got our efforts funded. We yeah. just need to find those people. And you know, this isn't just a Christian principle. I mean, like the local fire department that I talked about that I try to avoid like the plague. Right. I mean, if they called and said, you know, Jennifer, we really appreciate the gift that you gave. Let me tell you a quick story of how your $50 was used in the community right. to help people. And right. if they shared that, mm -hmm. you know, and said, you know, we want to try to help your family. We, we know that you have a few kids. We would like to give you guys the opportunity to come in and volunteer at the yeah. local department. Right. Right. You know, to try to get you involved. Right. And, you know, we want to we want to get to know you guys yeah. and we yeah. want to see why you gave that gift, yeah. you know, and right. if they invited you in and learn who you were, yep. right? And then yep. tried to figure out, well, okay, we have these opportunities, but right. they have these interests, you yep. know? Uh, they're really good at music yep. and we need to um, do this and this and this. Yep. Well, maybe we could invite them to play their instruments at yeah. this thing and yeah. that could be a way that they could help out right. the local fire right, department right, right. so that we can accomplish this thing. Sure. The reason why I think people don't do that is because it's it takes a lot more effort. Right. Oh, absolutely. It's, people have this like get rich quick scheme right. in their head. Big of, easy like, fast. We big call easy it. fast or the myth of the multiples right. That's where right. it's like it, we just need to call every single person in Tennessee yep. and just hit them up for if money. Everybody can and give $15. If everyone just gave $15 or if every one of 10 gave yep. $15, yep. then we're going to hit our goal. And so right. they just get on this like train wreck right. of just we don't care about anything, right. but just calling as many people right. as possible. Right. But then the problem with that is that you always have to do that. Right. Because the the last people who gave to you now hate you. Right. And they That's never right. want to hear from yeah. you again. Yeah. And so now you've got to call them all over again and get another, you know, 15%. Right. You know, right. but now those people hate you. Yeah. You know, right. and eventually you're going to go through the whole population. Right. And right. Then right. Everybody's going right. to hate you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and then what happens to the local fire yeah. department? Yeah. Right. You know, so it's oh, just. Absolutely. It, you don't want to do that. Right. You know? it's, right. It's like really. You really want to uh, change your mindset here. Right. So, That's exactly right. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the fifth word. Yeah. This one's a little bit different than the others in some ways, yeah. but it's it's equally, if not more, controversial than well, all the others. Before you say it, it has something to do with um, our course. Yes. You know, it has something to do with our number one... Um, you know, effort to right. bring in new partners, right? Right, which we call the perfect vision right. dinner. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of organizations call it a banquet, exactly, or they call yep. it a uh, a gala or right. a dessert or something. But a lot of people call it a banquet. That's right. And the yep. word banquet uh, has a negative connotation in your mind. Well, and explain it. Banquet to us. is that controversial word, and it is really it has certain connotations. Banquet says to me, first of all, old school, right. that you're talking about a an event that really is is more 25 years ago than today. It also builds up connotations of church basement, rubber chicken, and of course, we all know what the official bird of the Christian ministry is. It's the rubber chicken. Yeah. And it brings up the connotation of people locking the doors and keeping them locked until money has been extracted from them. All those kinds of negatives come from one word, 
And it's amazing how often why, that term where, is used. I mean, obviously, there must have been a series of events back in the 80s or 90s. Oh, it's going mean, back to the 60s and 70s, frankly. Okay. Well, yeah. I wasn't around back then, so could you give me <laughs> give me a little history lesson yeah. of how... Back when I went to school with Moses? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but yeah. like what happened back then yeah. that, uh, that caused the word banquet to become yeah. this negative thing? It really came down to a method of raising money mm -hmm. that was very transactional. I mean, these these banquets were really one of the catalysts for the transactional movement, in a sense, mm -hmm. because you would go to an event and essentially you would have to put up with paper plates and plastic tablecloths and a basement that you that smelled musty and people felt like they were there and they had to look around to see if it was really safe because they felt like somebody it was just a matter of time before someone got in their pocket and guilt was a major motivation of those asks and it was all about theatric and show uh early banquets that i was involved like, what do you in. mean like show like uh, like uh, early banquets that i was involved in had thermometers hmm. and people would run their envelopes up to the front of the room where someone was waiting and they would write down the amount and move the thermometer up and it was all about the show auctions were part of that right auctions were part of more of a sideshow in that but it really had to do a lot with how do we extract money from people it really was mostly well, it's if like not 100 the, the normal auction where they're like i've got a five i got a five no i got a ten right. i got a ten yeah. who's gonna give me yeah. a 15 yeah. you know it's like it's like you it's like their whole thing is to like almost peer pressure yes, you that's into right. yeah. getting money out of you. You were, you were coerced, you were made to feel guilty, and you 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 just kind of came out of that event feeling a little oogie. Right. You just, you know, you felt now, like, okay. A, was that a secular thing that started back then? It, and then it, the Christian movement kind of embraced, embraced that? that. Or, yeah, it, it, it was to a degree. Yeah, it was. But I think we, uh, I think there were, unfortunately, there were individuals who, who really capitalized on our generosity. But bottom line, I mean, it, it included guilt. It included, you know, manipulation. It right. included people feeling coerced right. in their giving. It definitely was not transformational. It was really all transactional. Right. The bottom line of that event was to raise money. Right. And so as a result, it really left a bad taste in people's mouths. Right. And I believe we still... We have really transferred those same feelings, those same thoughts, those same ideas right. generationally. And the term banquet really does still, even though we've cleaned it up a bit, there's still some of those bad feelings, those same thoughts, well, but the same principles. Of, <clears throat> there's plenty of organizations I can think of where they, they maybe don't do an auction where they're running people back and forth right. and doing all the theatrics, right. but now we do a silent auction. Right. And now we do right. fundraisers that are classier and, right. and bigger right. ballrooms. Right. And, but there's it's still the same thing, but it's like you said, yeah. we've, we've cleaned it up a yeah. bit and made yeah. it a little bit more kosher, yeah. but we're still trying to extract yeah. people. Yeah, bottom line, it's all about the money. And I will say that there are events that I haven't done anything more than break even over the years, but I have seen that event be extremely successful because we have surfaced volunteers, we've surfaced individuals who are willing to invest their time right. and their expertise, and we've brought on individuals who will give for a lot of years beyond the dinner itself. So there's been a lot of byproducts that have come from those. Now, by God's grace, we haven't had a dinner that hasn't at least seen two to three times 
more in the last few years. But it's from the standpoint of money, money should never be our perfect vision dinner strategy. One of the things we emphasize, money should never be why you do your event. Well, because we're really looking for long term partners. and And what do you get when you have a lot of volunteers? You get ownership, don't you? No. Those people are, are have a vested interest in the success of that event. Right. So right there, you just build a whole team of owners. We talk also about public relations. Getting your message out to the public. I can't tell you how many of our Perfect Vision dinners we do where people say, I've been giving to this organization for the last 10 years. I never heard some of these things. I never heard that you're doing this many good things or this many lives are changed. I am more excited than I've ever been about this organization. Or I can't believe I never heard of this organization. I've lived in this community for 35 years and I never heard of this organization. I'm so glad I came. So there's so many more things than just raising money. Well, if you're interested in learning more about the Perfect Vision Dinner strategy, Jim and I have actually put together a coaching program. And what it is, is it's a 20 week uh, program where we walk you through from very beginning, all the mindset strategy of the stuff that we're talking about, how to think differently. And then we actually take you through step by step by step for 20 weeks, going all the way up to prepare for your own vision dinner, uh, where you are going to, you know, build partners and life changing relationships with people. And ultimately, you know, we believe that through those relationships, you will get fully funded as a result. And that's really what gets us excited is seeing all these organizations raising a lot more funds. Uh, because they have the backing of these partners. Right. Um, and again, it might feel like semantics in a way. Like, uh, so you guys really do care about money. You care about giving, getting these organizations money, you know, but it's, it's done in a different way yes. that has a long-term benefit, right? right? Like, That's right. Um, if I told you that I could raise a hundred thousand dollars at a fundraiser, but every single fundraiser I have to get new people there because the previous people don't want to be there anymore. Right. right. You know, versus, you know, if I could tell you I could raise a hundred thousand dollars by inviting people in. Right. Right. And then those people get so excited yeah. that they yeah. want to give you yeah. the funds yeah. because you've made yeah. an opportunity available to them. Yeah. And then the next year they're so excited to come to the event that right. they bring their friends. Yeah. That's right. And then they give again and now you have their friends who get invited in. Right, right. And now they're so excited yeah. that they bring their friends. That's right. And That's then right. it grows and it grows yeah. and it grows. That's right. Right. So we've put together this strategy. It's called the Perfect Vision Dinner Strategy. And really, I mean, Jim has 38 years of doing 2,500 Perfect Vision Dinners in his lifetime. And as you heard his story, right, you came out of that 60s and 70s movement where you had this bad taste in your right, mouth. Right, right. And so you guys really sat down uh, in the 80s and in the 90s and really tried to figure out, well, how do we how do, we do something that has a different feel right, to it? You know? exactly. And all this stuff that we're talking about right. was really coming from your team mm-hmm. you know, at Crew right. and a lot of the work that you've done over the years. Right. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that have kind of picked up things yeah. uh, from you guys. I yep. know there's a lot of experts out there yep. who kind of do something similar. That's right. Uh, but they've really, they've really kind of extracted little things yeah, from you guys. Yeah, but yeah. but this is really the original course. Yeah. <laughs> like Un- this unfortunately, is- a lot of them really miss the mark on things. They, yeah. they go just far enough, but not far enough in that they're doing, or they do it because they don't know why they do it. But they they just it do works. it because they see us doing it, but they don't do it quite right. So right. that's, we see that often. Yeah. So the Perfect Vision Dinner is really the original uh, team who created this course. And uh, what we want to do is we want to set you up for success. We want to get you fully funded. We want to walk you through everything, right. Uh, the right way to do it. 38 years of experience doing 2,500 of these things. Uh, when you land on the website, fundraisingmasterminds.net, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Okay. You're going to see one of two things. Either you're going to see some buttons that say enroll now, 
or you're going to see a button that says join the waiting list. <laughs> and uh, if you see the button that says enroll now, you better jump on that because we usually only open this course up for about a month, twice a year. We do one month in the spring. We do one month in the fall. And that's your opportunity to get enrolled in our program. And then once we close the doors, uh, we make a waiting list available for the next season. Um, and you know, if you get to our website and it says, join the waiting list, join the waiting list because you know, we offer coupon codes to those who had to wait, right. you know? So it does, um, we do an early bird yep. special right? and we make that available to the people on the waiting list. So right. definitely uh, join the waiting list for sure. Yeah. So Jim, any final words that you want to leave with everyone? You want to sum up the five words again? I will. Absolutely. It's so important that we understand that words have meanings yeah. and that there are certain connotations that we have with this. Yeah. The five words are fundraising, and we want to use friend raising instead of fundraising. The second word uh, is donor. We don't want to use donor. I prefer to use the term partner. Right. Has much better positive connotations. Donate or donation. We prefer give or gift right. when needs. using those. And in the last two are needs. I prefer the term opportunity over need. And also instead of banquet, I would say use vision, victory, uh, gala, any kind of event that is does not connotate the th thought or the meaning of banquet. Well, Jim, this has been very interesting. You know, I never really thought about these words in this kind of depth. And, you know, it's it's interesting to kind of just be introspective and just think about the words that we use and what that means to other people. Uh, I'd like to know what you think. Do you agree with Jim about the word banquet? Do you agree that the banquet means the dungy basement where we're going to ask you for money? Or do you disagree? Uh, let us know in the comments yeah. below. We'd love to start that conversation and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, while you're there, make sure you subscribe because we release weekly content for development directors and executive directors of nonprofits. We don't want you to miss any content. Thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast episode this week and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Take care.